So good morning, good afternoon, boys and girls, moms and dads, students and teachers. Welcome to our uh, community of learning for this afternoon from CILC. And I'm so excited that today we have two different presenters beaming in all the way from Sydney in Australia. And I'm very lucky because I've got to hang out with these guys because I used to live in Sydney myself. So this is extra exciting for me. So remember the rules of the road. You're going to put all of your questions and comments in the um, chat window. Don't put anything in the Q&A because it's too hard for us to keep track of all that. Everything goes into the chat window. So we've still got comments coming in, uh, uh, in Jane. We will have programs next week. I don't know about past then, but we've got a little bit of donations coming in today. So that's great. Um, I would like to introduce Ms. Karen Player from the Sydney Science Education Group. And she's going to give us a lesson today about cool Australian animals. So Ms. Karen, take it away and I'll watch that chat window for you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here today all the way from Sydney. Um, so it's morning for us here. Um, it's very early in the morning. So it's four o'clock in the morning. It's actually still dark outside, but I really was excited to join all of you today um, and really talk about some of the Australian animals that I really love. So I've got a few things that I'll be talking about today, but I'm also going to go back in time. So I've got a friend up behind me here, which I'll show you right now, which is actually a model of an extinct Australian mammal. And we're going to have a big chat about mammal state. We're also going to have a little bit of a look at our hands as we go along today. Because some of the animals I'll be looking at today have some special features about their hands that are their adaptations to help them survive in the particular environment where they live. So if we you know, close our eyes and go back in time, over 18 million years ago, this particular animal lived in a rainforest. Now, the areas where it is found now is actually a really dry desert. And I'll show you some photos of the differences between that environment 18 million years ago and today. But let's have a little closer look at him at the moment. This is an animal called Waka Leo. It's about the size of a dog, a medium sized dog. And he's got really incredible teeth. They're a little bit hard to see at the moment. But if you have a think about your teeth and even put your fingers, if you've got clean hands, put your fingers and feel your back molars. They're individual teeth. These animals here, they, their back teeth are fused into one blade-like tooth. So imagining when their jaws are opening and closing, it's like a set of knives or a pair of scissors just um, eating their food up there. And what's very important as well is about their feet. So if everyone has a little look at their hands, we have something really special that helps us do things. And it's our thumbs. Not all animals have thumbs the way that we, we do. So these thumbs are really important. And this particular group of animals are marsupial lions and they have thumbs. This one, isn't even the largest of this species of animal. The largest one is an animal called Thylacoleo, which was about the size of a lion, getting its name, Leo. And it's, that's why it was called the marsupial lions, because these animals had pouches. So lots of mammals, there are three groups of mammals. We're gonna look at two of the groups today. But in Australia, lots of our animals are marsupials. So they have pouches. So this animal here is described as a pouched lion. And the largest other marsupial lions is Thylacoleo. So this guy here is my little mascot. He's been traveling around with me for years and he is the Wakaleo, so a little bit smaller. But I'll just show you a few pictures that gives you an idea one where we are, where the, um, the Wakaleo was found, and also just some pictures of what it looked like 18 million years ago, and some of the other animals that were found then, and also what it looks like today. Oh, there we go. 
So this is where I'm coming from for you today. So I'm from Sydney, which is in New South Wales, all the way over in Australia. And as I mentioned, it's oh, just after four o'clock in the morning now. This area here up in Queensland, so in the northern part of Australia, almost in the Northern Territory, is called the Riversley World Heritage Site. And there, it's so important, it's given World Heritage Site because of the amount of megafauna fossils. And megafauna means large animals. And in Australia, most of our megafauna is extinct. The largest was a giant wombat called Diprotodon, gets its name from its two front teeth, diprotodon. And it was found in Australia up to about 25,000 years ago. So really recently, and these were about the size of a car. So Wakaleo, my friend here is quite a lot smaller. This is what he looks like. This is called a scientific illustration of what our scientists believe this animal would have looked like. What they've done in my replica is made him look very similar to the Tasmanian devil. This is an illustration of just what it might have looked like. So lush rainforests, lots of different species that were getting quite big. We've got the diprotodon walking away over there as well. And lots of other animals we recognise at 18 million years ago as similar to what we would see today. But a lot of them were just much bigger. But this is what Riversley looks like today. Very, very different. So when scientists first came into this place, they weren't expecting to find such a big variety of fossils. But it's been so amazing. They have been doing scientific research on the fossils there since the year I was born, since 1976, they've been researching. And they are still finding new discoveries in these places absolutely now. So still scientific discoveries coming out, especially from the Queensland Museum, because that's where most of the fossils go. And my favourite thing about this fossil site is they actually excavate or dig it up with explosives. So they use dynamite. The rocks are so hard that they have to blow it up. We always imagine paleontologists, the scientists that study fossils, using little paint brushes and being very, very delicate, but they're actually using big explosives, getting big chunks of rock, blowing it out and shipping it back to the museums where they're able to take their time. They use acid to break down the rocks and to find the fossils, but new fossils being found all the time. So it's not just today that we have really interesting and unique fossils in Australia. They've evolved over time. And certainly in Australia, it's often called the land of marsupials because most of our animals are pouched mammals. So I've seen a few of you mentioning things like koalas and wallabies, and you're exactly right. They are the pouched mammals. But what I'd like to look at in a moment is just some of the different types of mammals that we do have, and some of the ones that I really like. So what I'll do is I'll show you my slides again, and we'll look at two types of animals in Australia called monotremes. So monotremes are the egg-laying mammals. And I can see a question there about my favourite fossil. So I'm going to have to have a little think about that. I don't know if I've ever been asked what my favourite fossil is. So Karen, I've got another question I think you are, is really good. Do the yeah. scientists check that there's no animal habitats before they blow up a site? Yes, they certainly do. Now, this whole area is considered really desert. There is not a lot out there. Australia's also been in a lot of drought in that region as well. Um, and they actually have to be careful at different times of year. That area in northern um, Queensland and coming into Northern Territory has the wet season. So it's got that monsoonal rains. So they're not going to be doing any explosives and those kinds of things during that really important part of the season. So they have to be waiting to, there's a particular fossil season they go out, which is in the driest time, which means there's the least amount of animals around. Um, and they do make sure that there's nothing obvious there um, before they do their explosives. But it is very targeted. So it's a little bit more like a quarry of how they're exposing the fossils as opposed to just, you know, 
throwing a stick of dynamite over your shoulder. Um, but that, that is a great question. So they do need to be careful that they're not killing or harming modern day animals in their exploration of the past. Thank you, that's a great one. So we'll have a little bit of a look about these monotremes now. Some of you may have heard about egg laying mammals and you certainly may have seen these kind of animals before. This is an echidna. This is a photo that I took in Tasmania. The echidna is actually quite a common animal found across all habitats in Australia. I've seen video footage of an echidna walking through the snow. I've seen video footage, very weird footage, of an echidna swimming um, across a, a, short, a small river. So they do really um, are well adapted to live in a big variety of habitats across Australia. Very, very similar to animals that have other spines. So hedgehogs and porcupines, those spines are their adaptation to protect themselves. But what makes them so unique and um, really only found in Australia, this particular short-beaked echidna, is um, the fact that it's a monotreme, that it lays eggs. And the other animal that is egg-laying is the platypus. So the platypus, often called the duck-billed platypus, not related to a duck, um, is also a monotreme. So it is the egg-laying mammals. And what's so fascinating, the platypus, when it was first found and sent back to England, because all of the animals were sent back to England to be identified by scientists, at the time when they were first discovered, we didn't actually have any scientists in Australia, they thought it was a joke. They actually thought they got the body of an animal like a beaver or the tail of a beaver, the body of a possum and the bill of a duck and stitched it together and sent it back to England as a joke. So for a very long time, it was considered to be a joke. And that's one of the reasons why it's often still referred to as the duck-billed platypus, even though it's not related to a duck, even though it lays eggs. So the thing to remember is all mammals have fur or hair covering their body. And that's one of the ways that we can tell them apart. So we've got our placental mammals that give birth to fully developed young like humans. We've got our marsupials like Wakaleo that have pouches. And then we've got our Edlang mammals. And I'll show you that they, the underdeveloped young that they have. Now this is a model. Let's move my skull there. So this is actually a platypus. And platypus sometimes will give, uh, lay two eggs, but mostly both the echidna and the platypus, it's only one. And this is the underdeveloped young. So similar to marsupials, um, that once the young are laid or hatched, they need milk. So they go to the milk producing glands and they grow, but they don't have hair and they're very, very underdeveloped. So they can't live on their own. They need to be um, looked after by the mum, by milk, in a burrow like the platypus and the echidna actually makes a special pouch. So not like a marsupial that they've got a pouch all the time. These ones actually have a muscular pouch. So they actually create this pouch. And luckily the echidna underneath its body doesn't have spines. So all of the spines of the echidnas are actually modified hairs. So they're hollow. And as you go to the top of the echidna, those spines get harder and harder and sharper and sharper. But underneath the body, it's actually nice and smooth and soft hair. So the poor little, little echidnas that we call puggles. So baby echidnas and baby platypus have a great name called puggles. And they're actually protected in their, in their burrows um, or in the echidna, away from the nice spines. So that's lucky. And I think I saw someone asking about when the platypus was first discovered. So it was quite early in the um, arrival of Europeans to Australia. So we've had our, the Australian indigenous uh, population in Australia for well over 60,000 years. But Europeans arrived in the 1770s to 1788. So the platypus was actually probably um, first discovered I think it was from the uh, 1788 arrival, but it could have been the 1770 ex 
um, exploration as well. But we'll just have a little look at the platypus skull because it is very different and it's, it does have a skeleton inside. One of the, the students wants to skeleton. know if the platypus is dangerous. <laughs> um, that is a great question because I, one of my favourite things that I always see on documentaries about Australian animals is the platypus is always listed as one of the dangerous Australian animals. Now, the platypus is actually really small. So most platypus, oh, maybe 40 centimetres long. Um, you often see them without what's called a scale. So it gives the size against something else. And most people kind of think that a platypus is maybe the size of a beaver. Um, and they're not that big at all. So one, they're quite small. But it is true, they do have something really unique in mammals, and they have a venomous spur. And the key with something being venomous, venom needs to be injected into you. If it's poisonous, you need to eat it. Now, I don't recommend you going out and testing that and eating lots of things to see if it's poisonous, but venomous has to be injected into you. So the platypus has a venom gland, and on its back leg has a spur. And that spur can inject venom into prey. Not really prey, it's more of a defense because they don't eat big things. Platypus have really um, soft jaws. They don't have teeth. I can show you that jaw again. It's actually just colored a little bit yellow. But here is what you would disguise, you know, refer to as teeth. And it's these little plates here. So what they actually do is they crush and grind up their food. So the picture I showed you before, it was eating a worm. So it eats small marine crustaceans and it needs to crunch them up, but that's about it. And it eats worms and things like that in the water. So it can't eat big prey. So it's not using venom to attack things. It might use that venom as fighting if it's um, a bit territorial trying to keep others out of its, or if it's feeling threatened by a bigger animal. So no one has ever died of a platypus spur um, that I've heard of in any of the research, but because it does have that venom gland, it's often put in those dangerous Australian animals. So it is one of the ones I always laugh at because it's certainly not considered dangerous to people in Australia. Um, you very rarely see one. I've never seen a platypus in the wild and I've been looking my whole life. Um, so they're very, very rare to see at all, especially with the urban, the cities spreading, a lot of their habitat is disappearing. Um, so a lot of the time when we think of things that are deadly and dangerous, it may have venom, but it might not come in contact with people. So you've got some things that are not as venomous, but could be more dangerous because people come in contact with them a lot more. So things like mosquitoes are much more dangerous because there's so, you know, all the mosquito diseases, bee stings, more people die of bee stings, and they're not often on the dangerous um, uh, documentaries. But certainly in Australia, the platypus is always there on the 10 most dangerous animals, but I've never been worried about it being attacked by a platypus. So that's so, lucky. If, so I, if I ever see one, I'll be happy. Miss Karen, I gave the kids a math problem. When you said 40 centimeters, I asked them, what is that in inches? And they came back with 15.75 inches. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's one thing I don't remember. I often use size um, and then sometimes that can help us get a bit of a scale, but it's always good to describe something. And this is one of the things that I always say, if you're going to take photos of any animals you see in the wild, try to have a scale of something against it as well, because it really, really helps. I used to work at a, the Australian Museum and we did lots of identification of things that people found when they were out. And our number one um, piece of information is give us a scale. Because if you take a photo of a beetle and there's no scale, we don't know if it's a centimetre, an inch, or bigger. So we always need that scale to give us a clue. So thank you as well, that's a good one. That's why I often go like this because <laughs> that can help as well. Okay, let's have a look at a couple of other animals. So we've mentioned our marsupials, we've mentioned our monotremes, which are egg-laying mammals, but let's have a look at a couple of other animals that we, well, you guys are probably pretty familiar with. 
So this is probably one of the most famous Australian animals. And I can, I can hear people going, ah, oh, isn't that cute? This is a very sleepy koala. And koalas do sleep a lot. Um, they're also marsupials, which means they are pouched mammals. They have a backwards facing pouch. And I'll decide whether I'm in a, how disgusting I'll be about the backwards facing pouch in a minute. But the most important thing are their thumbs. So if everyone holds their hands up again, have a look at your thumbs. You guys have one thumb. Really good again for helping us hold um, onto things, pick things up. Thumbs are really important for us to do those things, to hold and to grab on. So the koala spends its time in the trees. They're not very graceful animals and occasionally they do fall out and those kinds of things. So having two thumbs and they're what we call opposable thumbs, which means they move in that direction, means they can hold on to things really well. So those two thumbs on their front, on their hands essentially, help them climb trees with their really long claws, but also hold on to those trees which they use to help them um, sleep. They also have, they don't they only have one thumb on their back feet and they don't have claws on that. So it almost acts like a bit of a suction cup holding them on to the branch as well. They've got a really hard bum backside and that helps them in the tree to actually not be uncomfortable. So it gives them a little bit of cushioning. They can't really feel it very much there um, and it helps them holding. Often if it's really, really hot, they'll put their arms up in the air so they'll hang a little bit and that will help them cool down as they get airflow underneath their arms and their legs and helps them cool down in summer. Now, a lot of people would have seen at the beginning of this year um, that Australia had lots and lots of fires. And a lot of the fires that we had were up in our koala habitat. And we had lots of issues with, they think maybe over a third of our koala populations um, on the mid-north coast and down at a place called Kangaroo Island um, were affected by these fires. So lots of videos of koalas drinking water and having bandaged feet. And really something that's, that's really exciting news now is that many of those koalas that were rescued and cared and rehabilitated, so rescued and cared for until they were healthy again, have been released back into the wild. So it's really, really good news that those koalas are back out in the wild. The trees in Australia are very well adapted to, um, to grow after fire. Fire is part of their, their regrowth. So a lot of them have their leaves back and they kind of look like fluffy trees because the leaves grow all over the place as opposed to off main branches. But the koalas now have food that they can eat and they're back out in the wild um, creating, you know, that population again. So that's very, very exciting that we've got those koalas back out there. But one of the key things is those, those thumbs. Really, really important. So Kathy just wants to know, did the wildfires bring the koala population down massively? Yes, they, it was just happened that the areas were spaces that had a very high diversity of koalas. So the mid-north coast of Australia, a place called Port Macquarie, is actually known for a really big, big um, diversity of koalas. Um, they actually have a koala hospital up there. They were important in um, uh, doing the koala genome. So the whole koala genetic code was worked on at Port Macquarie, Koala Hospital, the Australian Museum, a couple of other museums and zoos around Australia. So they were, you know, they're, they're there because there were so many koalas there and they've been, you know, really great natural woodlands um, and forests still there. And another location was Kangaroo Island. We had a lot of, because it was separated from Australia for so long, it had slightly um, different genetic populations. So the koalas there were slightly different colours. You know, so as you go up the east coast of Australia, their colour changes a little bit. So, and we had fires pretty much all the way um, from Tasmania, um, South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, all the way up the coast. Um, it's, I don't remember the, the numbers now, but it was something like they think a billion animals have been lost in Australia. And they think at least a third of the koala population was probably lost at that time. So, so it will take a really long time for them to recover. 
Anna is dying to know. She's asked me six <laughs> times. Are koalas <laughs> mean in person? <laughs> um, imagine being woken up when you don't want to be woken up. So a lot of the time you do see koalas sleeping on someone's shoulder and they all seem very, very nice. They do a lot of koala petting at zoos. Very, very big for tourists, but occasionally, you know, they've got really sharp claws and so they can kind of dig in a bit and they can scratch. They do have a really kind of like a growl, uh, a sort of a hissy growl sound that they make when they're not feeling particularly happy. So I wouldn't necessarily call them mean, maybe a bit cranky because um, they do spend about 20 hours a day sleeping and it's because there's not a lot of nutrients not a lot of value in the food that they eat they eat gum leaves um, and there's yet yeah, there's not a lot so they sleep the rest of the time um, and the other thing I really need to mention is koalas are marsupials they're not bears even when I was doing some searching for that really nice sleeping um, koala image I kept seeing it from, especially overseas, koala bear, koala bear. So it's not a bear. It does look cute and cuddly like a teddy bear, but they are not related to bears at all. They're in, still a mammal, but they're in the marsupial. So they have a pouch and it's a backwards facing pouch. And I'll tell you now why it's a backwards facing pouch or how that evolved. So baby koalas spend their time in the pouch when they're really small. So again, it is underdeveloped young, this is probably, they're about the size of a, a jelly bean. So this is probably about a few months old, that size. And they are very underdeveloped, but they need to learn how to be able to eat gum leaves. So gum leaves, it's not something you'd naturally eat. So with that backwards facing pouch, the koala babies are really close to poo. So the mum actually produces a very special kind of poo called cecum that the baby koalas will eat when they're young. And it gives special bacteria in their stomach or their guts that will help them as adults be able to digest gum leaves. So that backwards facing pouch, you think an animal that climbs trees doesn't seem like a good idea, but that backwards facing pouch means that young can eat that special type of poo that's got all of the bacteria and everything that they need for their stomach to be able to, as an adult, eat and digest gum leaves. So it's a very interesting cycle, but it's, yeah. Um, and koalas are most, most closely related to wombats, which is my next animal we'll talk about in a minute. But I'm just quite having a quick look to see if there are any um, other koala questions that, um, that are popping up. So I can see how many koalas in Australia. I don't know the numbers anymore. They probably had a better idea a few months ago, but I think now, uh, especially people aren't being able to get out into the field to do their research. So it's going to take a while for scientists to be able to um, re-establish or find out again what that number of koalas are. But it's not a it's not a lot. It was down, you know, in the tens of thousands. So not particularly a common because a lot of the habitats were uh, coastal um, areas and a lot of those places of habitat has been lost due to urban development, cities moving in and now devastated by the fires. Two questions and then you yeah. move on out of koalas. First, somebody has been asking about their teeth. And yeah. secondly, Laura wants to know how long do they live? Normal. How long do they live? Oh, that is a great question. So koalas are relatively long lived. Um, so, you know, they're living, I think, for about 30 years. Um, but I, I have to double check. That could be a great research question for everyone later on about how long is the lifespan of a koala. So it is, you know, it's not 100 years, but it's certainly, you know, 20 to 30 years, um, depending. And I did see something about the platypus teeth as well. So platypus technically don't have any teeth. Um, they've got these grinding plates. Um, and what was the other koala question, Jan? About do they have teeth? How many teeth? Do koalas have teeth? Yeah, so koalas have grinding teeth. Um, their jaws, ooh, off the top of my head, I can't think of how many they actually have. Um, so, but they do have sort of similar the sort of molars and incisors and those kinds of things, but they're chewing and grinding um, gum leaves. So they're not sort of attacking and, and sharp tearing meat teeth. They are completely um, herbivores, so vegetarians, and they're using those back molars to help grind up. So gum leaves are not very soft. Um, 
and they have to um, yeah, spend a lot of energy getting not very much nutrients out of them. Great. I will just head over to wombats. So wombats, I've got... <laughs> You're all going to go away and thinking, that lady just talked about poo a lot because my next slide... <laughs> is poo. And the reason I'm showing this, I mentioned I was going to talk about wombats. So this is a wombat burrow in Tasmania. And the reason why I wanted to show this is wombats do square poo. So these ones, they're not perfectly square, but they're squarey. So you can always tell if a wombat's been around because of these square poo. And they like to put them on, on high places. So this is actually a slightly high part of the um, the ground in front of the burrow. So it's territorial. It's saying, hey, this is where I live. Um, I've got fresh square poo, so don't come near my burrow. Um, so it is one of the stranger of the, um, the scats and tracks. So one of the programs I run here in Sydney is all about showing pictures of what's left behind. Lots of poo, lots of uh, insect exoskeletons and those kinds of things. And what are the clues that we know about that animal? So this one here for the wombat, it's the square poo. And if you look a little bit close, you can kind of see that there's plant material in that poo. So what's inside the poo is also a, a clue to the animal and also what they're eating. So wombats are also herbivores as well. They live in burrows. And this is a wombat in the grasslands having a little bit of a wander around at the moment. Um, so wombats also have a backwards facing pouch. Wombats can get to, oh, let's, let's work it out. Um, we're going to be looking at, because they, they're quite heavy. They're short legged. Um, found a lot in the alpine areas of Australia and the grasslands. So they like a little bit of a colder habitat. Um, you're looking at, so what did we have as it was about 16 inches was our, 30, was our 40 centimetres or so. So you're looking at about oh, maybe 25 inches long, but they're like little boulders, short legs, very stocky. And they've got, similar to the koala, that really hard top of their backside and the wombats use that in their burrows so when you when they go into their burrow if someone tries to stick you know human stick their arm in um, but more likely if it was a fox that had been introduced or another predator trying to get in the burrow the wombat reverses out bum first and pushes up with its hard sort of top of its um, back of its backside and squashes things. So the scientists or people have been known to actually break their arm from a wombat crushing them in a burrow. So they're very, very strong. Their burrow, they just fit. So they use that sort of hard, um, so it's not like a plate, but sort of more a bit thicker skinned section of their, the top of their lower back um, to actually um, as a defense. Um, so they also have a backwards facing pouch like the koala. And I mentioned early on this animal called the diprotodon, getting its name from its two front teeth, di meaning two, proto meaning front, and dont, orthodontist uh, meaning teeth, was the largest of the Australian megafauna, getting to about the size of a, a car. I think it's about two meters tall at the shoulder, three meters long, weighing over a ton. And it is often described as the ancestor, looks like a giant wombat. And it is the ancestor of both the koala and the wombat. And it has a backwards facing pouch. So that's why both the koala and the wombat have that backwards facing pouch evolved from the group of animals that the diprotodon is in. So it all links. And that's why it's great looking back into the past to give us information about the future. Okay. Do you do you know anything about an animal called a bilby? Yes, I did see a bilby question go past. So a bilby is a small um, marsupial, very big ears. So we often will call it at Easter instead of Easter eggs being a rabbit. We often we, in Australia we have a big campaign to do the Easter bilby, and that's essentially saying let's not think about introduced animals. The rabbit being introduced to Australia had a massive impact on our native wildlife and it still does today because it competes with animals like the bilby. Rabbits can breed really, really fast. Um, so the generations and the increase in the population um, gets out of control very quickly. Australian animals are very much adapted to our droughts, 
our environments and they do and the bilbies live in the arid areas of australia so they breed really really slowly so the bilbies have been impacted by the introduction of the animals and so it's one of the things that we do at easter as a bit of a conservation message to remind people that these are native animals we should be protecting and not thinking about the introduced rabbits instead so you can actually buy easter bilby chocolates but they're uh, do it again about oh, they're, they're a bit smaller than a rabbit very long ears and it's and a long um skinny tail so not a not a fluffy tail and they're marsupials they live in burrows in the arid areas of australia okay let's have a look at our marine environments so as a scuba diver I have spent a very, very long time underwater. So I'm sharing some of my favorite marine animals with you. And this is one of the ones that I love to see when I'm diving. And this is called a weedy sea dragon. So in the same group as the seahorse, this is an animal that's found in the southern waters of Australia. So it is a lot, um, a lot cooler than our warmer waters and it's found all the way down from probably the mid new south wales all the way around the bottom of australia and south australia and they are amazing animals they don't have a pouch like the seahorses do where the males will um, give birth to the live young they actually will carry the males will carry their eggs on their tail there and they're absolutely beautiful animals and the reason why i like to show these as well is that they're often found washed up on the shore i've lost mine i have one to show you that's been washed up on on the shore and um the hard platy um, bones of the seahorse are often dried and left behind so you can actually see these washed up after big storms and they're absolutely beautiful and this is the leafy sea dragon. It looks like an animal that shouldn't exist at all. And I've been very, very lucky to see one of these on a scuba dive further down south. It was very, very cold. The water was really, really murky and they hide in the kelp and the seagrass. So almost impossible to see. Um, and we were very, very, very lucky to discover one um, on the last few minutes of a scuba dive. It was so cold that we're about to get out and we just just spotted that and it made our day. So the weedy sea dragon and the leafy sea dragon. As some of the amazing marine ones. And one of the, I realized I don't have a slide of it here, but my other really, really favorite marine animal, especially that I love seeing when I scuba dive, is the giant cuttlefish. So cuttlefish are in the same families as uh, squids and octopus. And they are incredible animals, really interested. So they like to come really close up to you. And they've got lots of tentacles out the front and they change color and texture really, really quickly. So they can go from being smooth and sort of um, have these ripples at the side to putting their tentacles up, making them all pointy and spiky on their head and go and flashing colour at you if they're saying warning, warning, go away. But most of the time, they just want to come right up to you and um, are very, very inquisitive and they want to know more about you. And they can get to be a metre. You guys can work that out for me as well. So a metre in length. Um, and very, very common off the Sydney waters. So pretty much nearly every scuba dive I do around Sydney, I will often see a, um, one of the giant cuttlefish, which is really exciting. Okay, so I might get Jan to help go through some of these questions and I can um, wrap up with knowing what some of the things that you wanted to hear about Australian animals. Okay, so Abby and Ben worked it out three feet or 36 inches. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. It's too early for me to do maths on the move. <laughs> have you ever seen a stonefish? I have, actually. Um, I actually worked at the uh, Sydney Aquarium. I um, actually did my work experience there. And one of the um, staff, actually, when he was cleaning the tank, got um, stung um, by a stonefish and his hand swelled up. So I don't often see them when I'm out, but there's been, I think once or twice I've actually have seen them and you almost don't, 
you almost stand on them. So luckily I'm wearing a wetsuit. I always wear gloves because I, I like to touch things and poke things and it's not a good idea underwater um, just in case. So gloves are really good and I'm wear and I'm really careful. But often they're under you um, hiding in the rock. So it can be really, really tricky. But I have sea stone fish and butterfly fish and lion fish and, and those kinds of things. So it's always really good just to, you know, be extra careful. But yeah, not too close. Amy wants to know whether you like koalas or wombats better. Oh, that's, oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> and you know what? I'm going to throw it out there. I think it, it's echidnas because they live in such a big variety of places. I think that's probably up there on one of my favorites. I love koalas and wombats because of their relation to the diprotodon, but those extinct megafauna are some of my favorites because I would have loved to been here 30,000 years ago and see some of these animals roaming around. It would have been pretty amazing, especially the um, Wakaleo's uh, cousin, Thylakaleo, which would have been terrifying. Exciting, but terrifying to see. What is your favorite animal out of all of them? <laughs> um, it's very, very hard. If I'm thinking about the ones I've just talked about today, it would probably be the cuttlefish, just because they're so friendly and happy. And yeah, they're just amazing adaptations, amazing environments. And yeah, they can change color really quick. So they've got a lot of personality. Is there another name for koala? The scientific name? Yes. I don't have it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. It's, it's about their fingers. It's got um, the, like a phalanges kind of in it. Um, but I can't, I can see it in front of me, but I can't think of it at the moment. So the scientific name, but in terms of another common name, no, it is just the koala. And that would have been a name that they got from um, the local indigenous population at the time when they were, you know, exchanging information about the first animals that the Europeans were seeing, they would often get the name of these animals from, um, from there. And Australia indigenous populations have over 200 different languages. So it could have had a different name if they talked to a different region about the koala, they could have got a different name. But the one that we ended up with was koala because it was the people in Sydney that would have been share, having that exchange with the Europeans um, early on. The scientific name is Fascolarctocinarius. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well Mr. done. Mr. Google at work. So I've got a question for the students based on the characteristics of these different Australian animal groups, where would you place a kangaroo? What kind of animal is a kangaroo? Put it in the chat box and Miss Karen's gonna tell us the answer. Great one. Justin says it's a marsupial. They're all saying marsupial. Is, are we right? Yes. Absolutely. So kangaroos are in the macropod. So macro meaning big, pod, feet, legs, and it's linked to the body shape of those of the kangaroo. So they get really small, um, all the way up to the big red kangaroo, which is still considered in Australia megafauna. Um, it's our largest one. And we've got a couple of people saying where they might be found. Desert is absolutely right. We've got lots of um, kangaroos found out in the arid region, especially that red kangaroo. And um, but all the way to some of our local grey kangaroos, swamp wallabies. So wallabies are also part of that group, that macropod. They're just smaller. So essentially kangaroos are often your bigger ones all the way down. And we even have the tree kangaroos found up in northern um, Queensland, which are beautiful animals, but they're sort of hopping around in the trees and it does not look like yeah, they're not very good at it sometimes. All right. Well, my timekeeper's giving me grief here. So I'm going to end your program, Karen. Thank you so much. We loved it. And where can we find you if we want more? Um, so you can find me at Sydney Science Education. There's lots of resources on my website. And hopefully you'll start seeing me pop up on um, some of the other CILC programs. As I get my time differences sorted out, we'll see whether we do some, um, some not quite as early mornings, um, but maybe a little bit uh, a little bit later on in the afternoons for you guys. So I'm looking forward to being able to chat to you again in the future. So thanks everyone and have a lovely afternoon. Thanks Karen, bye-bye.